Good morning, Church of the Open Door. How are you this morning? Great, great. My name is Brian Patchinger, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Open Door. And I just want to say welcome to you fathers again. Happy Father's Day. I know I woke up early. I was excited about the day. And then my wife's like, oh, happy Father's Day. I, I'd forgotten that it was Father's Day for a split second in my brain. So happy Father's Day to you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I've been learning a ton in the ancient Instagram series through the life of David. I feel like I've gone through like all of these, these emotions like of like excitement and praise and like, you know, like crazy, like feeling of confession and repentance and just been gone through the gamut and, and want to tell you and tell Pastor Jim thank you. Pastor Jim has been doing an amazing job and just want to say thank you to him. And, and, and then finally, I want to say thanks to my dad. My dad has made a huge impact in my life. He has loved my mom well. He has loved me. He has shown me what it means to be a godly man. And, and, and again, I want to thank even there's a lot of you who serve in different areas of the church, whether you're serving in children's ministry or adult ministry or student ministry, where you're pouring into that next generation of young people. Some of them have man, manly figures in their life. Some of them don't, and you can become that. And so, thank you. Uh, yet yeah, last week really made me think through this whole issue of sin and of what God is doing in our lives through redemption and cleansing. And, and I don't know about you, but I went back and started thinking through the, some of the decisions that I made in the past, and I started to really regret some of the things that I had done because of the way that they impact me today. There were things that I lied about. There were things that I just straight up disobeyed God in. There were lamps broken in my house that I was like, I don't know how that happened, Dad. You know, like, like it must have fallen over. Uh, there were things like, you know, I one time even drove a car and scraped, was pulling out of like a party and scraped the whole like side of the car. And then I devised this huge tale, this like lie of how it happened. And I just got myself like deeper and deeper and deeper into like into a mess of what was going on. And yeah, you know, I don't know about you, but there are things that, that I regret. There's things that I'm like, man, why do they impact me so much even today? And well, let me tell you is this picture of the life of David is very much similar to last week. Last week, we talked about this slippery slope of sin and we talked about how impactful that is, especially when we begin to become complacent, where we don't take things as seriously as we used to do. This is what Pastor Jim talked about last week. And then that we begin to get that carelessness with temptation. Things don't bother us as much as they used to. We maybe would take a step or a glance or, or say things that we shouldn't say, and we begin to go down this slope of sin, if you understand what I'm getting at. And so we then begin to even compromise our convictions. One time we would say, I will, I'll never do that. And then once in a while, we do that very thing. And we go down this slope to the point where then we actually commit the sin. And it's like, it's this slope that we go down. And, and it's, it's hard to do. And it's hard to, to like break that pattern. And then if you remember last week, Jim's point of that, that final point of his point, first point was sin always brings consequences. Always. You know, I'm a student ministry pastor, so I talk to students a lot, right? And so recently I was having a conversation and they were talking about my past, the past that I had. You know, I was involved in things that I shouldn't have been with, drugs and drinking and girls and just living the life that, uh, that, that I wanted, that pleased me, that was all about me. And so, and, and I recently had students say, 
Well, Brian, didn't those experiences, those circumstances, all of that make you into the man of God that you are today? And I was like, I guess. I mean, like, yes, good question. <laughs> you know, like, good question. I guess you're right. It did make me into who I am. And then, I, I mean, the, the question, like, dumbfounded me for a second. And so I, I, I thought to myself, wow, yes, those experiences did make me who I am today, but I would never, ever wish the consequences, the, the things that it's done to myself, to my, the way my worldview, the way I think, just, just physical consequences, I would never wish those consequences on anyone. And I, I hope I just hammered it home that sin always brings consequences. And, and no, it's never like, well, hey, I'm going to try this so then I can, you know, minister to people or, or you know, this, this, this sin isn't that bad and, you know, like I want to experiment a little bit. And, and if you're older, I hope you have gone through the process where you look through and be like, man, there's some decisions that I made when I was young that I wish I had back. Decisions that I made to disobey God, to, to run from Him, that I could have stopped and I could have gone away from. And so this morning, you can put this whole sermon this morning really under Jim's subpoint under sin always brings consequences because that's exactly what the text does in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel talks about the sin of David and Bathsheba in chapter 11, and then Nathan kind of confronting him in chapter 12. And then chapters 13 through a lot of the rest of 2 Samuel then talk about these consequences that happened because of what David did. And so we, we see that, you know, David had true confession, right? He cleansed himself from his sin. We saw in, in Psalm 51, he says, you know, create in me that, that pure heart. Don't count my iniquities against me. I think he was genuinely repentant because that's what the Bible seems to show. It seems like David truly confessed his sin. However, true confession and cleansing does not keep you from consequences. You know, there's things that happen in my life, those things that I described, and I could get down into the nitty-gritty of those things, but it, it, it wouldn't, it, we wouldn't want to talk about it. And, but those things continue to bring me consequences today, even though I'm a pastor, I've walked with the Lord for 10 years, you know, I, I love Jesus, there's still consequences that we face today. What are some of the things that you wish you could take back? Think through that. Wrestle with that this morning as we, as we talk and as we, as we pour into uh, this passage. I'm going to be, be explaining a lot of it to you. We're going to try to cover about three or four chapters of 2 Samuel this morning. And so just to give you a broad overview of what's going on. But the idea is that this true confession and cleansing does not keep you from consequences. David repented. Sometimes I think I talk to people who think and feel very entitled very like, you know, I confessed my sin. I did what I needed to do. Shouldn't God now bless me? Shouldn't I get what I need? Shouldn't I be okay? And I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, there's a sense of being cleansed by the Lord, being cleaned by the blood of the, of, of the lamb that we sang about, and yet there's consequences we face. Consequences happen to get expounded sometimes. Have you ever been in a lie and had to lie more because you had to lie a little bit to cover up the lie that you made and then you're lying some more? It's kind of like my car situation when I scraped it, just kept lying and lying and lying and lying. I don't know if my parents actually ever even heard that story. This one's for you, Dad. This one's for you. And so <laughs> there's consequences that happen. And so in the text, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the prophet Nathan comes to David and, and, and pronounces this judgment. You remember the story that Nathan uses to show 
uh, David and his sin and what he has done wrong. And, and the Lord really pronounces these strong judgments upon David. This is a man after God's own heart, a man whom God loved, whom he anointed you know, as king over Israel, who ruled his people, who wrote the Psalms and spent time. This is a man that the Lord then, because of the sin of David and Bathsheba, pronounced judgment on David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. So open up your scriptures there. We're going we're gonna to be looking at some of these consequences, but you could follow along in chapter 12, starting in verse 10. If you have your Bibles, just open up, and, and we'll begin right there in the text. And so the first real judgment that, that the Lord pronounces on David is that the sword will never depart from you. He says, like, David, you're going to be fighting, you're going to be toiling, you're not going to have rest from your enemies, and if you know 2 Samuel uh, or want to, I suggest later today you read through the rest of the chapter, you'll understand, or through the rest of the book, you'll understand all of these things that are happening, and you're like, wow, this is a man that God loved, and yet this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, all because of one thing. So the first is a sword will never depart from you. The second is, he says, he'll bring calamity on you from your own household. That word calamity could also be like rebellion. And, and so he says, Nathan says to him, there will be rebellion in your very household. It's going to come from you and, and it's going to be pronounced on you. And we'll see in a little bit that that's his son Absalom who rebels against him. That's Adonijah who rebels. And, and so we see these people and we'll talk about in a second. And so we also see that one close to you is gonna sleep with your very wives and your concubines. It's kind of weird, but, but Nathan is like, hey, you're gonna lose the very thing that you love, the very thing that you thought was yours Someone very close to you is going to come in and ruin it and wreck it and mar it and, and, and make it ugly. I wonder if David was sitting there and saying like, man, I love God. I repent, God. I, I did stupid things, God. Why is this happening to me? And then lastly, as we know, we talk about this one a lot, is that David's son, the son that was born that was conceived when he sinned with Bathsheba, that son is going to die and dies later in, in chapter 12. And so the, the Lord is really judging David, really spending some, some true time giving him consequences for what he did. And sometimes we shy away from consequences, I feel like. We are like, you know, I don't know if any of you really like consequences. I know for me... Uh, consequences I try to stay away from. However, consequences were never enough to really to get me to stop doing what I wanted to do. I mean, like when I was entrenched in the lifestyle that I was in, I mean, I had consequences. I had trouble with the law. I had, you know, yeah, trouble with the law. We'll leave it at that. And, and there were times when you should have looked at those consequences and been like, Brian, like, stop it. Like, what are you doing? But consequences aren't nearly enough, is it? I mean, we do things all the time. We spend time, we know often, we know it's wrong. There's probably people sitting here, right here today, whether you're in Avon Lake or the RNC or here in the auditorium, that are living in that state of unrepentant sin or they know what they're doing and it's wrong or they know what they're doing but they just don't know how to get out of it. If that's you, this message is much for you today. If you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, I, I, I see these dominoes and you're saying, wow, how do I stop the domino effect of sin in my life? That's what we're going to talk about. So we see these, these judgments upon David. And so we begin to look more at the story. You know, there's a lot going on in this story of 2 Samuel. And so, and it really is a tragedy. It's a tragedy because, you know, there is a ton that's happening. You have 
this one sin, this one sin of with David and Bathsheba, and it's kind of like this one thing starts it all, right? One sin begins to, to, to travel and, and spread its ugly head around. And so the first is, you know, really, David commits that adultery and murder. He spends time, you know, covering it up. He kills Uriah the Hittite. He takes Bathsheba to be his own, and that's when Nathan said, these judgments are because of that. And so David commits adultery and murder. And so now the rest of these points are really from chapter 13, where the story unfolds of this domino effect of sin. And so first it begins with David committing uh, adultery and murder, but then his son Amnon, his son, son Amnon, is the heir to the throne. He's the heir to the throne, and he says, you know what, I love this girl named Tamar, but she's my sister. And so what what they do is they devise this plan. Him and this not-so-good counselor named Jonadab devise this plan to say, hey, just become ill, and, and, you know, when the king comes and talks to you, have him send Tamar to you. And, you know, and Amnon's like, oh, that's a pretty good plan, Jonadab. And so, and so that's what they do. And, and Amnon ends up raping Tamar. He says he loves her, but he doesn't love her. He says he loves her, but basically what happens is he, he does the deed and does, does the horrible thing in God's eyes. Tamar begs for him to not to do it. And then this hatred wells up inside him. And he's like, and he's like, ah, oh. and, the, and the text says that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he loved her. Because we know it wasn't love. It was lust, and it was gross. And you know what? David hears about it, right? He hears about it, but he does nothing. He knows it happened, but he looks, and and so fathers, sometimes that happens with us, you know. We hear things that have happened in our families, and, you know, sometimes it's just difficult to even spend time dealing with the issue or dealing with the, the problem that's happening with our kids. And so, dads, we do nothing, and that's exactly what David did. You know, he, he could have stopped right there this domino effect of sin, and, except he chooses not to. And he, instead of, you know, confronting Amnon, bringing justice to the family, he doesn't. And maybe, maybe it's because of the very first domino because he had just committed adultery and murder. You know, the scriptures talk in, in Exodus 34, the scriptures talk about the sins of the father coming down on the, on, on, on the sons and the generations. And you know, you wonder how much David was lenient on his sons because of the very sin that he did, that he had in his heart. We'll come back to that. And so David does nothing, and then Tamar runs back to her home. She rips her her robe. She puts ashes on her head. She's weeping. She's humiliated. And and Absalom, he knows what happened. You wonder what's happening in the text and and what what is being said because Absalom's first words that are recorded are, did Amnon, you know, mistreat you? Like, he knows something was a little iffy in, in the, the statement. So the very first one is Absalom harbors this hatred in his head. And so he's spending this time, and he's like, you know what? Instead of talking to my brother, I'm going to hate him. Instead of talking to my dad and dealing with anything, I'm not going to. I'm going to harbor that hatred. And that hatred would be there for two years. Can you think about that? It says in the text that he waited two years for it to happen. You think of Absalom. You think of a guy who was like, he, he knew what he wanted. And what he wanted, 
was revenge. And then there's a story, and, and, and Absalom, it's during this time of sheep shearing and this time of feasting, and Absalom devises this plan, it seems like, and he asks David, King David, hey, come up, you know, and celebrate with me the sheep shearing. And David's like, no, I, I, you know, I shouldn't do that. You know, if I come, then, you know, all my posse's got to come, and it's a lot of people. You don't need to do that. So Absalom, very crafty, says, well, why don't, you send, why don't you send Amnon in your place? You know, which really wasn't a horrible request because asking the heir apparent, the heir to the throne to take your place in, in, in a situation really isn't too bad, right? I mean, it's like, you're going to take my place. And David senses something is wrong. He senses like, you know what, something's not wrong. Because in the text, he says, he says why should he go? You know, and so like, even if it was okay, he's like, he understands something isn't right. He understands that, uh, I'm not so sure, but he still does nothing. And so Absalom devises his plan and he says, you know, we're going to get Amnon drunk. And when Amnon is drunk and, and I say, hey, now strike him down, they're going to kill Amnon just like David killed Uriah the Hittite. Sins of the father coming down on the sins of the son, the one domino affects many, many others. And so, unfortunately, the story isn't over. Absalom then flees and he runs away and, and instead of, you know, David going after him and instead of him saying like, hey, you should, you know, come back to me and like, let's deal with this. Let's Get this issue of justice figured out. Let's talk about it. David does nothing, and he does it again. Fathers, sometimes in our culture, there's this whole issue of kind of like these wimpy dads who don't get involved, who, you know, like, this isn't for me. You know, this isn't for me. I'll do this. You know, I'll do what I need to do. It seems like our culture portrays dads like that often and portrays dads like saying, hey, you know, dads sit on the couch and, you know, watch sports while moms are super moms and do everything. And most moms are super moms. And, and, and so dads just kind of like go with the flow. Let's not be like that. I know also of dads who pour into their children, who love their children, who teach their children the word of God. Let's be like that. So David does nothing. This is a dark day in the dark story, dark days in the, in the life of David. And, and so Absalom is gone. He flees to Geshur and he's there for three years. So think of the time that happens. Like you have this original sin of David and Bathsheba. Then you have the sin of Amnon and Tamar. Then there's two years. Then Absalom kills him and revenges him. Then three years happen and Joab comes to David and he devises, again, devises the story to bring the son home. Because now Absalom is, you know, he's going to be the, the king and this isn't going to look good and this is political. Or, or it's just like, you know, the text says that David's heart, the spirit of the king, uh, yearned to go after Absalom. Another translation says the spirit of the, of, of the king ceased to go out to Absalom. And so you wonder what's going on in that text as you look in the last verse of chapter 13 and, and you wonder like, what's going on here? Five years have happened since the original sin and yet you have this issue of David still just not dealing with it. Maybe he's not as angry, but it's still there. The consequences of it are still there. And so Joab devises this, this story very much similar to uh, the way that they use a story for Nathan and the prophet to uh, convict David of his sin. And Joab tricks David into like, yes, of course I'm going to uh, allow your son to come home. And, and the woman says, well, hey, you know, your son Absalom is that person. You should let him come home. And so David does. He lets Absalom come home. However, he tells Absalom, or he tells Joab to tell Absalom, don't come home. 
It's like you're living far away in, to, in Gesher, and three years have passed, and it's like, okay, okay, you can, come, you can come home, but you just can't come to my house. I don't want to see you. You wonder if there's like a little issue going on there. Why doesn't he forgive Absalom? Why doesn't he just fully allow it to, to happen? And so, and we don't know, but we wonder what's going on. And so you have these issues that seem to keep compounding and these problems that just go evermore and they go and they go and they go and David doesn't forgive Absalom. So then Absalom finally gives David this ultimatum and he says, look, either just do something about it like, bring justice to the situation, or will you, will you forgive me? You know, like, either do one or the other. I can't stand being here and being away and not being able to see you. I might as well just go back to Gesher and be f- able to go wherever I want. And so Absalom gives him an ultimatum. David finally restores Absalom. And, you know, we see that the story doesn't end there, but that this, it, it begins to, to get better. For a season. And so let's look at some of these things that happen. These consequences, as we've shown, these consequences really accumulate when you fail to follow God's heart. You have one thing that sets off a, a multitude of sins in the lives of David and his family. And so, you know, I don't know what your life includes. I know my life has had seasons where I had just total disregard for God's law, not listening at all to what God would say, not listening to his words, not following him, doing the complete opposite of what God would have me do. That's in this story. It also includes this refusal to take action, this idea that, you know, no matter what, I'm just not going to deal with my sin. I'm not going to deal with my, the sins of my sons. Just refusal to do anything about it. There's also that idea of that incomplete forgiveness. David bringing his, his son home, but not loving him, not caring for him. You wonder which one of these dominoes could have like, been taken out so that none of the rest would fall. But that's not how the story goes. And so unfortunately, the tragedy of the story of 2 Samuel continues. And and so then the text says that Absalom started to steal the hearts of the people where he would go and sit at the city gates. And, and you know, Absalom was, was, was a gorgeous man, apparently. Um, it, you know, just a good-looking guy, and people wanted to be with him. And, and so he sits at the gates of, of the city where the judge sit, or often where the king would sit, and he would say, oh, if I were to be king, everything would be amazing. Well, he didn't say king, he said judge. But it was like saying, if I were king, you know, like, your problems would not be around. If I were king, it would be no big deal. And you know, it was a very public action sitting at the gate. I mean, people knew about it. And you know David knew about it too. But he did nothing. Again. You wonder if he's just feeling the political ramifications or the family ramifications of, you know, he forgave Absalom, sort of, he kissed him, but, you know, you wonder what's going on there. David knows what's happening. I'm sure, I mean, the, the way the words travel in the first century, I mean, people knew, hey, Absalom's at the gate. He's stealing the hearts of the people, and David did nothing. You wonder if some of that was graciousness on David's part to say, look, he's going to do that, but I'm not going to treat him bad. You wonder how much of that is David loving his son but not dealing with the problems. You have problems that you're unwilling to deal with, problems that we do nothing about. And so Absalom devises this series of lies and says, you know, hey, I need to go and make some sacrifices. 
can I go? And David says, sure, fine, go. And, but secretly, Absalom is saying, you know, like when I get to Hebron, you, everyone say like, Absalom is king. And so like they're devised this plot, this rebellion against David, which by the way, we see is a direct prophecy that Nathan gives, that rebellion, that calamity is going to come from your own household. And so Absalom lies to David and, and says, you know, like, hey, I'm going to go. He devises this plan and makes himself king in, in Hebron, and everyone is like thrown into a fit, and there's things going on. And then David, instead of, you know, fighting, because you think, this is David, this is warrior David, this is King David. I am like, I'm the man, right? I got my mighty men. I mean, he could have squashed that rebellion with no problem, I think. I think they could have gone in there, done a, done a little fight. The people loved David still, even though he was doing wrong. The people loved Absalom, but you wonder what would have happened. And yet, instead of doing it, David flees. He begins to slowly break that, that domino effect of sin. Because instead of taking action, instead of saying like, hey, I'm going to, you know, like, I'm going to take this into my own hands, he says, I'm going to leave. I'm going to get out of there. And Psalm 3 is, says that it's written in a time just like that. And in Psalm 3, David begins to yearn and to, and to have a heart change to say, like, God, what it, are you doing? You alone bring salvation. And so to add to the list that the tragedy includes, you also have this conspiracy and, and deception that happens. And so the tragedy goes on, and the tragedy in our lives seem to go on and on and on. And so you begin to ask yourself, you say like, okay, I, I understand that, that this might happen, and I understand of what's going on, but how do I respond when there's these consequences? How do I respond when things are happening? Because, you know, oftentimes people are going through a really tough time in their life, and what do they do? They, they really just complain and begin to say, like, you know, this is, uh, this is what's happening. I can't believe so-and-so. I can't believe how this is happening. And instead of dealing with the issue, they complain. Or, or others just downright become apathetic. And they say, like, you know, uh, it doesn't matter or who cares. One of the best phrases of young people is just, you know, like, eh, whatever. You know, like, we hear that a lot. Because, unfortunately, they don't want to deal with issues, and so they become just apathetic and to say, oh, you know, whatever. And then worse after that, they would just give up. It's be like, yeah, it's not worth it. You know, these consequences are going to happen. You know what? My one sin led to another sin. This, then that. Maybe they would even curse God and say, God, I can't believe you would let that happen, or I can't believe that you won't stop this somewhere. And yet there's really good news. And there's good news because God can and God does stop it. And what happens is, uh, in the story, David then has a kind of a heart change. I think it's a very pivotal verse in 2 Samuel, where David, this is when David is fleeing from Absalom, he says this. He says, everyone was crying, cried loudly as the king and his followers passed by. They crossed the Kidron Valley and then went out towards the wilderness. Zadok and all the Levites also came along, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God, which we've been talking about through this series. They set down the ark of God and Abiathar offered sacrifices until everyone pa had passed out of the city. And so you picture this big hoopla. They bring the ark of God out and all these people, they're leaving Jerusalem, leaving the, the, the kingdom so that Absalom can reign because he doesn't want to fight his son. And, and, and the king then says this. He instructs the Zadok to take the ark of God back into the city. He says, if the Lord sees fit, David said, he will bring me back to see the ark and the tabernacle again. But if he's through with me, then let him do what seems best to him. You know, it seems like for the first time in this saga, in this tragedy, in the first time, David surrenders. Instead of just doing nothing or instead of just being angry, 
he surrenders. And he says, God, whatever you do, whatever seems best to you, I'll trust you. I'll follow you. Psalm 3, like I said, Psalm 3 is, is a psalm that David wrote during this, either during or about this time when he fled Absalom. And he says this in Psalm 3. He says, O Lord, how many are my foes? How many uh, rise up against me? Many are saying to me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. You see, David knew that he had to surrender because salvation, deliverance, came from the Lord and the Lord alone. He wanted to break that saga, the tragedy, the domino effect of sin. And so true confession and cleansing can't keep you from consequences. Consequences come, you know, as we fail to follow God's heart. And God's heart is for us to live surrendered. We have to surrender ourselves to God. You know, even when the domino effect of sin in our lives is triggered and one falls, it seems like they all fall. It seems like there's no hope. It seems like we can't do anything about it. And yet, this is the very time when, when the Lord Jesus meets us. This is the very time, as David wrote, that salvation alone becomes to the Lord. Maybe you're sitting and you're thinking, you know what, I will never, ever be able to break this domino effect of sin. There's things that have plagued my family for years and years and years. And maybe you're going to be like, you know, I, I, I just don't know what to do. And we have an opportunity each day, each new day, to put away the deception of sin and to trust God. You know what? Consequences may come. You know, I mean, think about it. You make horrible, wrong decisions and consequences are come. And yet, and yet God snatches us often out of the consequences and he holds us close and he holds us tight and he says, you know what? I died on the cross for you. You are forgiven. I love you. Trust me no matter what. Trust me in the midst of consequences. Trust me when things are good and things are bad. Trust me when your family rises up against you and, and, and things are happening. Trust me no matter what. Surrender to me. We need to surrender our lives to the one who breaks the effects of sin and death. You know, it may come. There may come a time. But each new day, we have an opportunity to surrender. Each new day, when temptation comes, we have the opportunity to flee, to run, to seek confession and repentance and cleansing of our sin. Each new day, we have that power. Let us trust Jesus. Let us trust Jesus for what he did on the cross in securing our salvation. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're saying, you know what? I, I need that. I need to surrender. I pray that that's where we are all day, every day. No matter we've walked with the Lord for years or whether we've walked with him for a very short time, to surrender our lives, to say, God, you're enough. When consequences come, to keep surrendering, to keep standing up, don't do nothing but serve God. Live surrendered. Fathers, you know, the stats say that when a father walks with the Lord, so much more will the family. 
The percentages are, are, are unbelievable that when a father is sold out for the Lord and is willing to surrender, even in the midst of their own sin, even in the midst of the things that they've done, if they surrender, then how much more the family will come alongside him. And so this morning, we have for you fathers, for, for you young men, young men and fathers, we have these dominoes as you leave. Grab one on, uh, as you leave from both the RNC and the main auditorium and, and the Avon Lake campus, grab a domino to remind you of the domino effect of sin and that Christ died in our place. Christ the Redeemer. We can surrender to him. It says, live surrendered. Might we as a congregation live surrendered in the midst of all that is happening, in the midst of what's going on. May we surrender to him. Let me pray. God, thank you for the fact that you desire a relationship with us. God, thank you for not leaving us to ourselves. Thank you for not making us deal with these consequences of sin on our own. Thank you for not just saying that, oh, this is what you're to do, but not loving us. God, you sent your one and only son to die in our place. So God, I pray that we may trust you. I pray that we may live surrendered. I pray that we may cast down the sins of our youth, God, as we ponder the regrets of our lives, the things that we've done wrong. God, may we live in a new level of surrender. May we trust you no matter what. When the domino effect of sin, when we feel like it's plaguing our lives, God, may you step in. May you pluck us out. May you break the power of sin. God, you're the redeemer. And we praise you. We praise you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.